And then they just drive off, and all the other cops are distracted, and we get McLean at the end. Sorry. And we get McLean. I'm going to lock you in the room. <laughs> Damn it. Hello, and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies, 1975 to 1995. This week, we are talking about the 1990 Amazing Christmas movie, because this episode's coming out Christmas Eve Eve. So this is the most amazing Christmas movie that we could think of. It's the most amazing Christmas movie of all time. We're talking about the July 4th, 1990 premiered movie, Die Hard 2, (laughs) Die Harder. (laughs) The fact that it premiered in July is hilarious. (laughs) On July 4th. But the key is, is that we're doing the second Die Hard because that is the more Christmassy of the two movies. That is the Christmas movie. I will defend till the day I die. And I love Die Hard. I love Die Hard. I love Die Hard 2 better. (laughs) I love yes. it harder. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why it's die harder. Because you got to love it harder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As I mentioned, this movie originally premiered on July 4th, 1990. It is directed by Rennie Harlan. Rennie Harlan has quite the movie history. He directed Cliffhanger, The Long Kiss Goodnight, which we will definitely get to on this podcast at some point in time. Deep Blue Sea Mm -hmm. and The Nightmare on Elm Street 4, which is arguably the best Kruger movie. Funny, because Cliffhanger kind of ties us in with the Rocky theme from the other week. My favorite part about Rennie Harlan is that he's also nominated for Worst Director, for the Golden Raspberry for Worst Director, five times times for the adventures of ford fairlane cutthroat island driven exorcist the beginning and the legend of hercules (laughs) sorry (laughs) that's quite the list of movies now now i'm gonna go back to cutthroat now which which driven is that because i think i almost watched that the other night uh that one i don't know it's in uh i think it's in the early 2000s is when that one yeah i almost watched that the other night i think that has um by choice (laughs) Ryan Gosling, I think, was in that. Oh, no, that's Drive. You're thinking of Drive. Don't I'm you, di- don't drive. you be yes, mixing right. up Drive with Driven. <laughs> drive is a good movie. <laughs> it I could wanna... have been. I have no ref- frame of reference. I didn't watch it. <laughs> I want to come back to Cutthroat Island because it's something special. Came out in 1995 starring Matthew Modine and Gina Davis. It cost $98 million to make and took in $10 million Ooh, at the ouch. box office. That's not, that's oh. a boo-boo. <laughs> and somehow yeah. he kept getting work. Yeah. Wow. But it doesn't matter who directed this movie. Randy Har- I mean, Randy Harlan has a good cliffhanger, long kiss, good night, deep blue sea, solid. I mean, not great, but solid. It doesn't matter what Randy Harlan was going to do behind the camera. This movie is written by Steven D'Souza and Doug Richardson. Now, hold on here a little second. D'Souza wrote or co-wrote the following movies. This is a short list. 48 Hours, Commando, Jumpin' Jack Flash, The Running Man, Die Hard, Hudson Hawk, Ricochet, Street Fighter, and Judge Dredd. Richardson wrote or co-wrote Money Train, Bad Boys, and Live Free or Die Hard. <laughs> I kind of feel like they should be somehow involved with this podcast with that list of movies. Yeah, no. Can we get them to come on here? <laughs> well, more importantly, it's produced oh, by Joel motherfucking Silver. Of course it is. <laughs> so, written by an amazing staff, Bruce Willis, a Die Hard sequel. All Rennie Harwin had to do was show up and make sure no one died on set. Well, do we know? No. <laughs> Did that happen? No. It was his movie to fuck up. Yeah. It was done for him. I do want to give a special shout out to the editor. I know we get off in the, I'm getting off in the weeds here a little bit, but I just want to give a shout out to him. His name's Stuart Baird. He is a legend. This is the third movie he's edited that we've talked about just on the Go With The Heat podcast, including Demolition Man and The Last Boy Scout. His range covers from The Omen and the original Superman in 1978 to Skyfall in 2012. He also directed Executive Decision, U.S. Marshals, and Star Trek Nemesis. The man is a legend. Wow. Yeah, that is that is a body wow. of work. <laughs> yeah, he, he's he's like, he's probably just like that fixture at the studio that like he just, he edits everything, all the best ones and stuff. All Rennie Harlan had to do was we'll show make up. sure that everyone showed up on time and the food was taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> Put out those little sandwiches with the sticks in it. And get in your chair. <laughs> well, we normally like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives, but you know, we're not really that interesting. And this podcast is never going to take sponsorship. And saying that, this episode is brought to you by Hot Dog Foaming Soap. <laughs> 
When you're thinking about food, or if you have a man in your life that loves baseball, get him hot dog flavored foaming soap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he will appreciate it. it'll take him back to the ballpark you will have a it's a great time during the off season for baseball there's all the stuff the trade talks going on and spring training get him that hot dog flavored foaming soap <laughs> he won't be able to stop also great <laughs> condiment on top of other foods because it's a it tastes like hot dogs you put that on top of some popcorn mm, perfect also all the dogs in town will follow you around <laughs> We're one step away from hot dog scented laundry detergent. Oh, <laughs> gross. <laughs> and if you don't know what we're talking about, go back to last our last episode where we talked about Demolition Man, which involved a lot of talk about armor hot dogs and <laughs> dial soap. Yeah, it much... turns out they're related. <laughs> without much further ado, let's go ahead and get into breaking down Die Hard to Die Harder. Because that's how you have to say it every time you talk about this movie. <laughs> let's go give this one the go with the heat treatment. <laughs> All right, so before we get started, because this movie doesn't really have like an opening, we just get straight to it. And when I mean straight to it, like his car is being towed in the first three seconds and the camera just <laughs> zooms in on the license plate. You find out he's in D.C. So before we really get down into the weeds of this movie, let's check in with this week's guest stars because it's it's sequel and it's Bruce Willis, but it's Die Hard. And there's, this cast is stacked. Unfortunately, we just don't see Sipowitz's ass in it. What do you got for us this week, John? Well... Obviously, we get Bruce Willis, a Walter Buck Buck Willis, as we know him here. Go go with the heat. We get him back. So we already detailed him in The Last Boy Scout. Or if you're familiar with our Vice stuff, we detailed him in a couple episodes from Vice. So I'm not going to go too uh, deep into Bruce Willis. Go check out our other podcast or uh, check out his character, Bruno, which he made a CD about. So, but... <laughs> He plays John McClane. Let's jump into the other guest stars and uh, talk about some some new guest stars like Holly McClane, played by Bonnie Bedelia. And actually, she was born Bonnie Bedelia Culkin. So <laughs> her parents, her parents, I bring that up because her parents were a journalist and a writer, but they pushed all four of their kids towards acting. Their kids being Christopher, a.k.a. Kit, Terry, and Candace Culkin, other than Bonnie. Now, Bonnie was the first to get in acting, but Christopher Kit is the father of Macaulay and Kirian Culkin. Okay, there we go. I'm like, there's got to be a Macaulay Culkin yeah. <laughs> connection to so, this somehow. So, Bonnie is technically Macaulay Culkin's aunt. Wait, you're talking about there could be the, the I mean, the single greatest movie crossover of all time. <laughs> I know time, where you're going with this. Which is Macaulay Culkin versus John McClane <laughs> in Home Alone 7. <laughs> <laughs> totally possible because technically Holly McLean would be his character's aunt in that movie, my guess. Wonder funny that she wasn't invited to Paris though. Must be when they were going through the divorce. Yeah. <laughs> I, Writing I'm, fan fiction over here. I'm here for John McLean stepping on ornaments and getting his feet cut up, but still making it to the roof and jumping off with a hose tied around his waist. <laughs> She was actually the first sibling to get into acting. Uh, she was cast in some stage acting as early as nine years old and also studied ballet. But she got a first TV role as a teen in the daytime soap Love of Light. She would do that for five years and she would do more stage work and a few other soap opera appearances in the 60s. She really wouldn't do much other than a, a, just a couple small movies, a couple small parts. She would have a resurgence in the 80s and 90s, including this movie movie you might know her she did 103 episodes of the tv show parenthood as camelia braverman or camille braverman oh my uh, god i just realized in... she that yeah she's the grandma in parenthood i didn't know she's the grandma in parenthood <laughs> yeah wow other than not that, even put that together she's been in... yep other than that she's been in heart like a wheel gloria and anywhere but here our next guest star is william atherton who plays thornberry he's an actor producer he's been in a bunch of stuff some of his early stuff was 1974's the sugarland express which is a uh, spielberg film 77 he was in looking for mr good bar he played a uh, epa official walter peck in Ghostbusters. That movie, Welcome, or what is it? Something, Mr. Goodbar. Hello, Mr. Goodbar, something like that. That has come Looking up. Looking for a, Mr. Goodbar. There we go. Looking for Mr. Goodbar. That has come up a bunch of times in guest stars in the history of our show. That, that It's like the clue 
<laughs> but of candy bar movies. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he also played Professor Jerry Hathaway in Real Geniuses in 85 mm. and Dr. Faulkner in Biodome in 96. Now, by <laughs> the way, I recorded that directly from his IMDb page, so that means he is actively advertising that he was in Biodome in 96. <laughs> So he's uh, starred and co-starred in over 30 other films. Our next guest star is Reginald Vell Johnson, who plays Al Powell. He's most known as Carl Winslow in Family Matters, the neighbor to Urkel. He did that for 215 episodes between 89 and 98. He was also in 84's Ghostbusters. He played the jail guard in Ghostbusters. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Small world, yeah, right? He's, yeah, wow. he's like a person it, like, uh-huh. when they're in jail. Because wow. technically, this would be like three or four years later. Another movie, he was in Crocodile Dundee that you might not remember. He was also in, in that. And that's important because coming in 2020, we are going to be getting a movie called The Very Excellent Mr. Dundee, which is going to be another Crocodile Dundee movie in which Shut Reginald Fell Johnson will be in. Shut yep, your face. No. Why? There's going to be a lot of that coming up. Oh, okay, we got to talk about that later. I'm not even going to get into that right now, how disappointed I am. (laughs) It's society. So, yes. Carl Winslow will reprise his Crocodile Dundee role in The Very Excellent Mr. Dundee, coming soon. Okay. Uh, Other than that, he did 53 episodes of a show called Heart of Dixie, 11 episodes of an animated show called Tron Uprising. Oh, he did the voice in that show? Yeah, he's the boss. Yes, he is. He's the boss. Oh, my God. That's like my favorite. Like, listen, I love Tron. Tron Uprising is my favorite thing of Tron. Like, that show was great. I was so pissed off when they only made one season. See? You learned something new every guest stars. <laughs> and a various number of one-episode guest stars, including an episode of Crossing Jordan. <laughs> Wait, it took me a minute to reach to that. Oh, my God. Crossing Jordan is going to come back. <laughs> Our next guest star is Franco Nero, who plays General Esperanza. He has over 200 movie credits. He was born in Italy, um, and he's been in a crap ton of movies. A lot of foreign films. Early in his career, he showed up in a lot of westerns and spaghetti westerns, which are the Mm. European version of westerns. Yes, spaghetti westerns are great. He's like a huge name in spaghetti westerns. As far as like stuff that we would know, not so much, except for he was in the original Django movie in 1966. Mm. He played Django. He was oh. then in Django Strikes Again in 87 as Django, and then shows up again in Django Unchained at playing Amerigo Vespi in that oh, movie. That's so cool. that's that's a fun Cool reference, yeah. Yeah. To him cool. being the original to Django. Our next guest star is William Sadler. He plays Colonel Stewart. He's got some pretty notable roles. He's best known for his role in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey in 1991. He was also in The Shawshank Redemption in 94 and Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight in 95, which is by far my favorite Tales of the Crypt mm. movie. Other TV and movies he's been in, he was in 12 episodes of Private Eye. He was in the movie K-9, as well as the movie Rocket Man. Mm. He was also in 61 episodes of Roswell and 14 episodes of Wonderfalls. But guys, guess what? In 2020, he will play Death in Bill and Ted Face the Music. Yes, okay. yeah, a I did know that. A new Bill and Ted coming. movie. <laughs> yes, cool. so another uh, coming soon. You know, it's a different reaction um, there because Bill and Ted movies were fun. And the third one is they build it. It's like, hey, look, we're just going to get together. We're going to make a thing. It's going to be, a, here's what we guarantee you. It'll be a ton of fun. Yep. Crocodile Dundee. I'm like, ugh. I mean, why? Why? Why did they make the first one? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Sorry to all you Crocodile Dundee fans. (laughs) Ouch. Sorry. I know some of your dad's hurting at that comment, but it's the truth. Why did they make the first one? (laughs) What we're saying is Australia, take Paul Hogan back. Take him back. Why is he even here? How do you get his visa renewed? Oh, by the way, just... Go read the plot of the new one. Oh, God. So, yeah. Well, I mean, the plot of He's the first the, one was terrible. Crocodile <laughs> Dundee is getting knighted, and he must restore, he must have, he has to go restore his honor because mm. something happens and it defiles his name. He has to the go restore first his movie honor before I'm being knighted. <laughs> Dennis France, who plays Carmine Lorenzo. And Dennis France, he's played a lot of cops, guys. Yep. <laughs> like, that's his thing. 
So aside from like Popeye and uh, City of Angels, every other role is like being a cop. But like follow this progression of being a cop. So early roles, it, he played Dr. Marino in 1980's Dress to Kill. Then he played Officer Joe Giller Gillard in 13 episodes and a TV movie version of Chicago Story in 81 to 82. Then he played Angelo Carbine in eight episodes of Bay City Blues, which I believe he was like a detective in that. And that was in 83 to 84. Then he played Lieutenant Norman Bunce in 43, 49 episodes of Hill Street Blues from 83 to 87. So by the way, during that run, he also did uh, a few episodes as the character Sal Benedetto. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> he wasn't always the same cop in Hill Street Blues. So they pulled like Michael. a Miami Vice thing. <laughs> His character in Hill Street Blues would get him the spinoff as Norman Bunce in 13 episodes of Beverly Hills Bunce. <laughs> from 87 to 89. Oh, I'm sorry, from 87 to 88. Hell, he lasted one He would then do Die Hard 2, and then after playing a cop, in, an airport cop in Die Hard 2, he would play Lieutenant Stan Krieger in 13 episodes in a TV movie of The Nasty Boys in 1990, which came up in one of our previous episodes. <laughs> Most of like, good old Nasty Boy. <laughs> <laughs> like looking it up. <laughs> Well, yeah, because uh, that was, uh, I believe the connection there was, wasn't that, not Dolph Lundgren, but his co-star, Bruce Lee's kid. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. His TV Lee. show? I'm going to watch the hell uh, out of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm so after that. Nasty Boys, after playing a cop in Nasty Boys, he would play a cop in NYPD Mounted, a TV movie in 91, which is about cops on horseback in New York. <laughs> I should get on it. Like, you have like a special he ladder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He would then get the role he is most known for on NYPD Blue, on NYPD Blue, playing Detective Andy Sipowitz for 261 episodes from 93 to 2005. I mean, that, oh, that show sounds so familiar. Like, <laughs> I don't know who would who would watch all those episodes. You know that I'm watching it. I'm on my like twelfth run of it right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's it's. You know, guys, you, know, you know what it is? It's in my dreams. I just hear it in the background Bobby. all the time. <laughs> Bobby Simone. That's like, and... <laughs> but guys, that's like five or six different cop TV shows and like five or six different cop movie appearance credits. Like like that's just a crap ton of playing a cop. That's all you can do, just be a racist cop. <laughs> What I know is that when Melissa's done watching Young Writers, she'll be moving on <laughs> to whatever this is. Why you gotta story. out me like that? <laughs> to Nasty I'm, Boys or I'm NYPD actually, Mounted? Actually, I'm still watching NYPD Blue and the Young Writers at the same time, okay? <laughs> Get it right. Are you gonna watch Beverly Hills Bunts? No, I'm not. But I am watching the Nasty Boys trailer and I will be watching that. <laughs> And by the way, it's Brenjamin All right, Bratt guys. in it. That's who was in it. Ah. Oh, okay. Okay, that's the connection. All right, guys. Our final guest star is John Amos, who plays Grant. And he's quite possibly the most interesting guest star of all of them. But John Amos plays Grant. You would also know him from playing James Evans Sr. as the dad on Good Times for 61 mm -hmm. episodes from 1974 to 76, as well as playing Cleo McDowell in Coming to America in 1988. Mm -hmm. Guys, I say he's quite possibly the most interesting because he was a pro football player. He played for both the Kansas City Chiefs and for and in Canadian the Canadian Football League. And he would work as an advertising copywriter and as a social worker. While doing that, he would be a stand-up comedian in the Greenwich uh, Green Greenwich Village circuit that would lead to him getting a staff writing position on the Leslie Uggams musical variety show in 1969. And that would kind of be his in into like Hollywood. Then that's when he would get a role as Gordy the Weatherman on 13 episodes of the Mary Tyler Moore show to three episodes of Maud, which his character would be spun off into that good Tom's character of James Evans Sr. But ultimately he would quit the show. He had disputes with the network because they were going away from the theme of the show and focusing more on um on his, the character of his son they were going away from what he felt was 
the moral values of family values stuff. And so mm -hmm. he decided mm -hmm. to quit the show. So when he quit, they actually wrote him off by killing him off in an episode where he died in a car crash out of state while looking for work. But he's fought a long time in his career trying to stay, trying not to get typecast as like thug number two in roles. But he's done a ton of stuff. So other than Playo playing Cleo McDowell in Coming to America. He also played Officer Bill Bundy in seven episodes of Future Cop. He played Captain Dolan in 13 episodes of Hunter in 84-85. He played Reverend Stiles in the movie Ricochet. He also played Coach Sam Wilson in 12 episodes of the show In the House from 95 to 97. And guess what, guys? Coming soon, he's going to play Cleo McDowell, reprise his role as Cleo McDowell in Coming to America. Yep. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was In getting worried. I was getting so. worried that I was going to be the TV show that's going to make a comeback. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> no. Yeah, no, he's coming to America. So as I mentioned, this movie opens up and it's like straight to it. In fact, it's so straight to it. He's getting his car towed. He runs into Stewart at the airport. He meets up with some other cops like legit. This thing goes so fast mm -hmm. that you have barely enough time to even mention the man naked doing pilates or yoga or some <laughs> shit in his hotel room and his hotel room is close enough that he's able to like walk to the airport yeah he gets there real fast yeah in the time of john mcclain getting well, towed he's able to show up <laughs> how early is john mcclain showing up to pick his wife up he's already there he's parked like clearly he's been there a long time because his car is being towed he's been parked there for so long <laughs> the entire time he's arguing with this meter maid our bad guys doing naked tai bo in the mirror which i mean let's admit we've all done some naked karate at one point in time i think <laughs> i think it's a testament to him showing up so early is, is that's an old-fashioned thing right like where you could just hang out at the airport for a long time and wait for your person to show up and like you can't do that yeah. now who does that now <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's that used to be a thing because that was before you used to have to go through all the security stuff. Yeah, so you could exactly. just walk into the airport and just go hang out at a restaurant. And like, that was cool. All over the news that's happening inside of the airport, inside of the naked mansion, or as we'll find out later, <laughs> Colonel Stewart. He's just dick flapping in his room yeah, in we front both of his TV. Thing, <laughs> flopping it around. So on the news, they are covering the Republic of Valverde and the dictatorship is coming to an end. And the ousted dictator slash he's being pushed out because of communism and America's messing with their uh, politics that literally everyone in the on the planet apparently is watching this news because in every scene in the opening in every airport in every hotel room even at the church when the old man <laughs> gets killed he's watching news about the Republic of Valverde yeah exactly <laughs> yeah which is is crazy because I've never heard of the Republic of Valverde I think it might be fake <laughs> Guys, I think, think they made it up. Are you sure? Are you because sure? Because I've been Googling the hell out of it, and I don't find it. Maybe anything. it was on an episode of Ice or something. Yeah, I'll just say, like, <laughs> it, it, it sounds like something that a Jimmy would take Tubbs and Crockett to on, <laughs> on a boat. Jamaican <laughs> Tubbs was definitely there. He's been there. So you're saying that it's Miami Vice's jurisdiction? <laughs> yep. Because everywhere is their jurisdiction. Okay. <laughs> just like anywhere you go, you're a cop, and you can do whatever the hell you want to do, like John McClane. If exactly. you have a badge, you can go in that restricted area where you don't even know what it is. <laughs> wow. McLean is going in the places he shouldn't be going. We also get a white van where these guys just roll up to a church, throw out a few cones, and go and murder the keeper of the church. On that theme, too, is that reporter. And she's in the very opening of this, too, where she's covering Esperanza coming into town. And like I said, there's literally nothing else happening in the news. And she's just going around and she's finding people all over the place. People that work for the State Department. Mm -hmm. Colonel Stewart. John McClain. Later in the movie, she makes it up into the freaking tower. Like, yeah. What I'm saying is, is that Carmine is not She's much at job. security <laughs> at this airport. Not because really. people are just going wherever the hell they want <laughs> yeah, exactly. to. But of course, John McClane sees these militants that are getting set up. He sees a bag exchange. He sees them setting their watches, like putting them in sync. And then he sees them spread out. So he goes over to tell the police. But, uh, you know, the guy that towed his mother-in-law's car is the one that he finds first. So, you know, people might die. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> this all comes when he used to be Secret Service for the president, right? <laughs> <laughs> the senator? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
the same guy, right? We also see at the same time, uh, because Holly, meanwhile, is on a plane. She's flying in. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's coming out from her career. She's got to land, and her husband's got to be waiting for her. Uh Uh-huh. The husband came ahead to stay with the mother-in-law ahead of time in preparation (laughs) for her coming. (laughs) They make a point to reference that he moved from New York to L.A. for her career. I don't think we ever actually hear, like, what she actually does. Like, even in the first one, like, they're at the company party, but no one actually mentions, like, what they actually do. You know, I wonder, does she still work for for the Nakatomi Corporation? I hope not. (laughs) There's no no more Nakatomi. He's gone. (laughs) Maybe she's, like, she was the next one in charge. Yeah. So maybe she's, like, the president now. Uh Uh-huh. That's why he stayed oh, with her. She's that's sugar why he mama. had to move to L.A. She's getting him all the, got all that money. <laughs> so on Holly's plane, we see that she happens, just happens to be on the same airplane as Thornburg. Yeah, what a coincidence. And he's berating the staff about not getting his first class seat. And they're saying, that, look, we saw your report about bimbos in the sky. <laughs> and we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> as you mentioned, guys, shoot up the church. Just take out the one guy in the church and then start digging the place up that way they have access to the cables. Back at the airport, McLean is now following the man. He This group of men he finds then back in the baggage area after flashing his badge as someone that works at the airport and says, let me into the back and mm-hmm. go get a real cop. And the guy's like, all right, cool. <laughs> Puts in his code. <laughs> Let's him yeah. into the back. Yeah, so he just straight up rolls back into a restricted area, sees two guys doing whatever they're doing, and they just get into a gunfight, and no one in the airport apparently hears this gun battle. And they just start going at it, because they end up getting on a fist fight on one of the conveyors with all of the luggage. And so they're knocking luggage off. Like, no one's bag is making it to their destination anymore. And, and the fight ends in the most epic way possible with one of the bad guys being killed by the conveyor belt itself (laughs) of like like he gets stuck in it's only it's made for a certain size and he gets like squished my favorite part in this scene because it's it's diehard so john mcclain is the same with always with john mcclain is he really good or is he just really lucky because he's just kind of like this he's charismatic but he's not always like the 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 perfect warrior, right? He kind of fumbles around, hangs mm-hmm. off a broken pipe for a while, drops his gun. Yeah, you know, like there's all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, not that a good happened. shot. <laughs> he missed a bunch of people and, and it's not, shooting at. <laughs> yeah, it's really rough fighting, dirty fighting, because it's not like Wesley Snipes like kung fu stuff. He's, he's like <laughs> hitting them with stuff off the ground and like it, like mm-hmm. getting them in headlock. Just wills it to happen through effort, right? Not from skill, just yeah. from effort. He won't quit. Yeah, that that is true. He doesn't quit. And I will agree with you, John. The biggest question I have is that how come no one can ever hear what's happening? Because there was a lot of bullets yeah. fired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have major complaints at the Delta desk when my baggage arrives with six bullet holes in it and a bunch of blood. Also, they probably messed up yeah. the machine. Ain't nothing going to go through that machine after that guy's body's been in there. All those people are not yeah, getting their really... luggage at their destination. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there's probably entire flights where there's just everyone's waiting around the conveyor and nothing. Her body just comes out. <laughs> yes. Squished. Squished bad guy. <laughs> McLean, of course, gets arrested because the cop doesn't understand who he's supposed to be chasing and then has to explain when the, he tells him, like, I'm actually a cop. Oh, yeah, I lost my badge, but they find his badge and his gun later because, you know, he's going to need that later in the story. And actually, they take him back to the airport city police precinct, which must be <laughs> nearby. <laughs> Like, it's a whole police station, like, with full cops and people getting mad at the counter and, like, people in handcuffs on a bench. Like, they say, like they've got their own detectives. There's a vice squad upstairs for airport <laughs> vice. It is huge. And, and yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, it's massive. And, and uh, Sipowitz is the, uh, obviously, the head of this. And I love that this is the one chance that they fit in. So apparently, Die Hard 1 and 2 are the only two where the main cast of top four billing reprise their roles. And so, and this is the only time we see Al from the first one, the cop from the first one, he calls him to verify one that he's a cop. And then a couple, he he calls him also to do some police work for him i guess no he calls him just for the police work he calls and tells him that there's a fax is going to be coming and then powell calls him back and says hey i have the information on the stick gotcha okay now i have an interesting question on that he calls him 
partner. Do you think he calls a partner because they're friends or because they're partners now at the LA police force? They must be partners or something. Well, they, clearly they work together. So I don't know if they're like actual partners, but yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That's <laughs> that they're palling around together. Eating yeah. Twinkies. You no, know, we need a diehard oh, 1.5 yeah. where they're doing like beat cop stuff together. No, why don't we just go back to that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I know they wanted to try really hard for this airport for Dulles airport to have like a legit full police department because they wanted to have like he got pulled into the precincts and the captain of police slams the door and yells at him, yeah. tells him to get the fuck out of my office. And I wanted to have all that kind of stuff. But I mean, come on, come on. It's airport security. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, exactly. The entire movie takes place in an airport. Never once do they go back to like FBI headquarters. If they do have it, I would love to have like a movie that's Dolores Airport SVU. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> There's yes. enough crime at the airport. Special like, crimes division. Damn, we've got our fifth homicide of the day. <laughs> uh huh. L- LAX homicide. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to sleep until I get a TV episode of a Dulles Airport SVU <laughs> and there's someone who is a serial killer that talks to dolls. <laughs> and it's got to be one. <laughs> Now we start to get clued in on what the actual plot is because we go back to the church and we see that they're hacking in the power lines and they build, they literally build their own little control tower into into this church. It's a full airport control tower. Like, like, actually, and they have all the same equipment. McLean finds out that the stiff that got squished. He, he's, <laughs> the squished one. <laughs> he was like reported dead years ago. So it's like obviously suspicions are high. And then at the church are setting up a full tower. And then that's when McLean comes into the tower to go talk to. Um, Carmine. Car- no, not Carmine. But, oh, uh, uh, um, uh, Fred Thompson. It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> McLean is trying to make his case to the air traffic control controller who's apparently in charge of the entire airport like police and everything yeah he tells us police what to do too yeah, yeah he's in charge <laughs> hey, of everybody hey, that that that's an important job it would get, later get him elected to the new york <laughs> <Yeah>. state uh, <laughs> attorney <laughs> state attorney's office mclean is telling him like hey something bad is going to happen here's the information on this person that the dead person who isn't stealing luggage like what carmine was saying who's armed to the teeth stealing <laughs> luggage at the airport. He's This is actually something really, really bad that's about to happen. And the traffic air traffic controller is like, okay, Carmine, just go do some investigation. It's Christmas Eve. It's a huge day, plus Esperanza coming in. The FAA hotline lights up, and it's Stuart, our dick-flapping guy. <laughs> <laughs> Still flapping. <laughs> He's now finding going, like you're saying, John, this is... We're getting to the meat of the story here. He wants, obviously, <laughs> oh, I know there, Melissa, you got a problem with the meat of the story with the dick flapping man? Dick flapping. <laughs> We're finally getting to the meat the of the story. No, I'm fine, really. <laughs> I was surprised that the FAA has their own special telephone, like like the little red phone on the president's desk, like they get their own. The F- like It's like super important. The FAA calls in, stop that flight. <laughs> It's, it's the air traffic control tower. How can I don't have access to everybody? Why aren't all the phones to FAA? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, that's what I wanted. So, all right. also but apparently, <laughs> apparently, they've hacked in. And one of the things they hacked into was the single phone line going to this tower. <laughs> <clears throat> Seems like a flaw, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were informing and they informed them that basically they have cut themselves in between them and the people in the airplanes who they're trying to talk to. So they're not able to talk, talk to the people in the airplanes. And now the people in the airplanes think that Colonel Stewart and his terrorist buddies are air traffic control, which this is getting pretty elaborate. Just to and get one we guy. find out. Yeah. And we find out Colonel Stewart is very, very knowledgeable about air traffic control and how he needs to act because he fools everybody, man. He's awesome. But now he lays down the threat that, hey, so you guys can't talk to any of the planes upstairs. And if you don't follow my demands, we're going to systematically start crashing them or making them land in funny ways. I, I don't know. <laughs> like, what is their threat? <laughs> like, what else could you do other than just crash them? Like, could you divert them accidentally make them fall out of the sky because they don't have any gas yeah yeah thank you 
this story is great, especially for the era, for being 1990. Yeah. Because, and if you followed our Vice stuff, I did a This Week in Vice. So we talked about when the Vice episode aired, what was happening in the 80s during that time. Literally every week I could have talked about a terrorist or a plane crash that happened. So yeah. So air safety was like top of mind for everybody but not really doing anything about it because they no. didn't have any rules or anything <laughs> which there was no like you can't wear your shoes and go through yeah. the which TSA. is what's crazy and <laughs> in in 2001 obviously that's that, that that that's a horrific tragedy but up until then there hadn't been any real major problems yeah but, but it changed 80s, everything like planes were falling out of the sky all over the place like every week there was a plane crash yeah somewhere. and it was like they were they were just said like hey you know what we can't really do anything about that it's just what happens sometimes planes fall out of the sky. sometimes cops just flash their badge and we give them access to the back <laughs> What's of the airport the big deal? <laughs> sometimes they shoot and yeah. kill people stealing luggage <laughs> like, <laughs> they now know that they have no way to talk to the planes but one of the air traffic controllers has an idea of a way of a new system they just installed that'll let them talk to the airplanes so yeah, they're, they're going to lead they're, they're going to lead the airport SWAT team over to this new tower <laughs> Because that apparently thinking, they have their own SWAT team as well. Of SWAT course, team. airport city SWAT. They they don't seem like they're well trained. I'm just saying. <laughs> also, I'm not sure that any of them actually wore any life like <laughs> like bulletproof vests. Yeah, that would have helped during that. <laughs> they had a lot of pockets, <laughs> but they have a lot of protection. <laughs> I had a lot of pockets in that vest. <laughs> they could store their yeah, bubble so gum and like you know floss and all kinds of random things knickknacks but yeah, you can say how inept these guys are so they're, they're supposed to go to the annex yes. with their um, what that guy's name is I know uh, that guy's yeah. name. um they're supposed to go to the annex with him they're gonna it's this new part of the airport where there's a new tower mm -hmm. that's not tied into the system and no yet. one's supposed to know about it yet they're gonna then. go turn it on and then they'll be able to communicate with the planes and this SWAT team is spoiled by no bulletproof vests it's someone turning on the escalator. Yeah, exactly. Also, why did they all yes. look like they were brothers? Was that a SWAT team full of brothers? They looked like they were all middle-aged Italian men with black hair. That could be, because remember the scene later where they jump into the car and he's like, this is my brother. Oh my God, maybe this maybe they're all related brother, to the car mine. Dom. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. It's like maybe like his whole family, like it's like a mob thing. <laughs> the entire SWAT team is foiled by not only them just turning the escalator on, by them pretending to be painters, which mm -hmm. I will give it to them. They were pretty elaborate. Like they actually wore their tearaway suits and they had brought paint. real paint. <laughs> they actually had paint. Which is impressive. My favorite part about the paint scene is that when it, when the first guy's like, hey, what are you doing here? And they shoot him. The other guys are like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> the other SWAT team guys are like, oh, my God. And then they start like, how are you trained if you're, like, shocked that someone got shot? And you're like, oh, my God, duck. <laughs> also, there was, like, was 12 of them. <laughs> I was actually a little confused about the guys there to kill because like the shootout happens and then we find out like that was they were there to surprise them and to protect because they knew they were going to try and use that backup terminal and it ends the shootout ends with them blowing up the backup terminal satellite so that they can't use it but my question is, is like well then why couldn't they just blow it up and not waste the bad guys in the shootout like they could have just blown it up to begin with. <laughs> why didn't they blow it up like, did they... Three before like or just like go in there not maybe not blow it up but couldn't they go in there and like disconnect it so they couldn't use it yeah, it seems like, like it's was a waste it all... of people <laughs> like was it all just to kill the SWAT team and if so like could they have planned this better could they have just blown up the SWAT team too they could have blown up the escalator <laughs> They could have just made the escalator not work. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that happens all the time in airports, and that stops everybody. They don't know what the hell to do when the escalator doesn't work. <laughs> Meanwhile, McLean has met Marvin down in the subway system okay. of the airport. Marvin the mole man. He lives in the subway system. <laughs> He's a sad man. Because every airport has a janitor that a mole. Uh, lives beneath <laughs> there. Yes. Well, and, and McLean gets there by. So he's in the tower, and he's seeing some. Things, some bad things are going to happen and the power goes out and then the reporter comes barging in and Carmine says reporter and McLean both got to get out of here like they're civilians they need to get lost then McLean climbs up on top of the elevator and then climbs down from the elevator down into like the sewer system and finds Marvin Marvin uh, just hanging out in the sewer <laughs> Once smelly. Again, all of the other employees, all of the non-security employees of the airport, extremely friendly and helpful. 
first the guy lets him into the to the luggage area now marvin shows him like blueprints and stuff <laughs> super helpful thinking marvin may have showed the terrorists some blueprints too <laughs> yeah he's willing to do whatever <laughs> yeah. it takes twenty dollars is twenty dollars exactly <laughs> he lives in the, he's a mole he lives in the sewer <laughs> Just don't mess up his system. McLean's able to use Marvin to figure out what tunnels he can climb through, including like a big vent. You know, die hard one. Vent, yeah, maybe. got it. I mean, just like through. going through the elevator. Just uh -huh. like the yep, yep. He gets there too late. SWAT team gets taken out, but he's able to save the engineer that figured out that they could go to that annex. Uh, right at the last minute, he's even able to defeat the T-1000, which is, you know, that's, that's, that's quite a feat. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's no laughing feat. <laughs> Up on that, on Holly's plane, big traffic jam. Looks funny. Back at the airport. <laughs> Holly, she's there. <laughs> What's strange about the scenes where they jump back to Holly is like they're clearly just trying to involve them until later on in the movie, which in their parts come up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's mostly just her bickering with, with the reporter dude. At the airport, this is when Stuart finds out that the airport security tried to go around him, not listen to his orders, and have the 747 ready to just go. Just like and he thought the they FM were going to do. Land <laughs> unmolested he that's that's his words not mine those are his words that's a really weird <laughs> word <laughs> he finds out that they tried to go around him and still communicate with the airplanes so this way he's gonna prove how much control he has and john like you were saying his tower command prowess his that he controlling has. experience yes <clears throat> he is an amazing air traffic controller is able to crash one of the airplanes. So and let's they they go through the point of showing you specifically how he does it too. He talks to the airplane and he, he has one of his guys set the airplane's ground 200 feet below where it actually is. And so apparently this airplane's going to come down to land and the ground is going to surprise them. Like, oh my god, it's the ground! <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Surprise! Crash! I mean, I'm, I'm not an air traffic controller, but how is that a possible setting? When would the ground yeah. need to be Why too are we or... <laughs> what I, Oh no, I'm not the a, ground is shifted. You I'm not a... <laughs> I'm been... not a pilot, but I think if I was going down the land uh, and I don't see lights, I would think, you know, hey, hey guys, something's wrong. There but are no it's snowing, lights. right? Uh -huh. So they can't see because of the snow, and they're like, oh, there's no visibility. You've and... seen those little windows in an airplane? They yeah, can't exactly. see shit. And it's all steamed up because it's just the two of them in there. The window. <laughs> two and heavy breathing guys in there Let's together. Be honest. Yeah. <laughs> McLean does everything he can to try and get him to stop going out there with his torches everything. trying to show them. He just them. waves his arms around a couple times. But the real story here is that he tried something Yeah, he tried stupid. to do something. The other Every people just sat with their mouth open in the tower like, oh, Yeah, all the people in the tower oh, heard what was happening. God. They were like, oh, wow. They got out their popcorn and started eating us. They watched the plane <laughs> come in for a landing like, oh, this is going to be a mess. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to be cleaning this up for days. <laughs> not like putting ambulances or police yeah, cars out on the runway or something anything. like that trying to show them. Like, no, it's like, oh, God, this is going to be no. bad. Well, crunch. Well, <laughs> it, it is it is, it is, is enough of a wake-up call that they finally do call in the Coast Guard or the Army Reserves. I think these are reservists. <laughs> <laughs> these are definitely reservists, guys. This is their one weekend a month. How, but, okay, why doesn't the FBI get involved? How come, like, I'm Literally, really they send in, like, 12 reservists uh, in, in, like, their little battle because tank. Because the FAA um, is, is a federal thing, right? So I'm, why wouldn't the FBI yeah. be involved? I'm pretty sure the reason why they didn't get involved sooner, uh, what the story is supposed to be, I know it doesn't make any sense. You look at it and go, like, there's, like, a terrorist taking over an airport. How come you haven't immediately called, like, the FBI and the CIA yeah, and the military like the CIA and stuff, and stuff like that? Yeah. Because of the airport SWAT team. They thought they had it. They thought they could do it. Yeah, maybe this was like a state-of-the-art <laughs> airport, and it, that was like a pilot program. It was yeah. not going well. They <laughs> thought they could handle it themselves without I, getting anyone else involved. Yeah, that didn't go over very Actually, well. <laughs> technically, plot-wise, is because they're bringing in the general through this airport that they contacted the Army, and the Army sent these guys in to handle the situation. Because they're expecting the general. That's the plane. That's the big deal coming in. Not the other 15 planes circling above about to run out of gas. The important one is the one that the general is flying in from Ecuador or wherever. The Republic of Alberta. Yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> Sorry. Naming actual Sorry. places. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, what's coming about from that the Banana too, Republic, don't you know? He is, he is flying... He is flying into D.C. <laughs> he is flying into D.C. where they're going to try and get 
uh, capture him and move him onto another plane and fly away. Earlier in the movie, that the Esperanza plane is being escorted by two fighter jets. What happens to them? They left. Uh. <laughs> also, like we talk about that, like, the pilots in that plane, they're pretty brave, right? Mm, like yeah. they tried the he tried to tell them like, "Hey, what are you going to do? I'll crash the plane." Uh-huh. He didn't know Esperanza could fly it, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it didn't work. <laughs> Well, so far, everything's going to plan for the terrorists. The general's taking over the plane because apparently they only hired one security guard to watch him. Yeah, I mean, that was an oversight, I think. <laughs> hey, the Republic of Alverde's got a budget, too. <laughs> <laughs> and the terrorists have everything under control, you know, a mile away from the airport in their little makeshift traffic control where they just crash the plane. So, <laughs> but here we have... Army reserves, they're going to save the day, and they don't need John McClane's help f- help with it either. No, no, John McClane is out. And also, Barnes has figured out a way to actually communicate with the airplanes using the outer beacon, which just sends the tone, the beep. Because he's actually smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one that figured out the annex. He also figured out how to use the outer beacon. But McClane is out, which means he has to go see Marvin again. <laughs> Marvin, I need you. <laughs> this is also when Esperanza is able to kill the guard kill those two pilots, take control of the plane, and also land it in really bad weather. He's good. Yeah, yeah, he's good. They're able to coach him down. Credit to Stuart, able to coach someone as an air traffic controller. Man, he's like legit. He was in the military, right? (laughs) And McLean uses Marvin to be able to get out to where Esperanza is landing. So he's able to meet him out there, but he's only able to hold him for like literally 30 seconds. Because Esperanza is a badass. (laughs) He can fly the plane. He could also fight you. He's not your regular dictator. (laughs) I know. He so thought that he was just going to like citizen arrest Esperanza. (laughs) The general totally gets the better of him. And then they end up almost killing them and shooting up the plane. So, and then once again, terrorists escape and we find out that our army reservists actually work for the terrorists. (laughs) They're terrorists themselves. Damn lazy army reservists. Should have called in the Coast Guard. (laughs) McLean gets Esperanza briefly and then the... The militants show up. Stewart shows up. Esperanza is able to escape, like, I mean, like, really easily. But now McLean's stuck in the airplane. And this is when there's that great scene of where they're throwing grenades into the cockpit of the airplane. And then he escapes through the emergency Mer- eject yes. system. Those guys, those uh, those militants, I believe in them. Because they threw, like, 12 grenades in that window. It didn't miss a single one. Okay, because they're not our actually Army reservists. They're Army Rangers. <laughs> oh. Turns out they know. <laughs> I just say, like, I don't think Bryce Harper can make that throw 12 straight times. <laughs> so McLean escapes, but the police are coming. And so Stewart's crew are not able to go advance on McLean. So he's able to survive. Esperanza escapes. And then that's when, back at the airport, Barnes tells McLean, hey, I think I know where they're at because they got to be close by. They got to that airplane really fast when Esperanza landed. I think they got to be over in this area where this old church was because there's a power line and communication lines over there. So instead of telling... Like the the military. uh The military, (laughs) him and Barnes just go by themselves out there. Because Barnes has got a set on him. He's not afraid. And Barnes (laughs) is like, I know about satellites and shit. I'll be there too. I don't know how to get... He's almost been killed like six times already today. (laughs) On Holly's plane, they're circling. They're starting to run low on gas. um, And they're getting concerned about it. They're like, man, we've been in here for a long time. She asked the stewardess, do we have enough gas to circle or fuel to circle like this and the steward is like oh yeah of course then she goes up to the cockpit like they're getting on to us they know <laughs> what, what do you want me to do <laughs> we're screwed which is funny because these days in the day and age of Wi-Fi on planes we could just easily google it and be like no nah, yeah. we only got about 10 more minutes <laughs> <laughs> yeah also they would know because you'd be googling it and they'd be like well you know some plane crashed at the airport you're what <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> be mass panic and people would take over the plane people making sending instagram messages on the plane we're yep. not gonna make it <laughs> exactly so at that church mclean is fighting hand to hand with just one person somehow he's gonna take over the whole church but he has to use an <laughs> icicle just to take down one dude the sentry that's outside of the he, he barely takes him out <laughs> 
<laughs> but he doesn't quit. He just keeps going. No. And then that's when the military shows up. Shootout when Stewart's crew finds out that the military is out there, but they all switch over to the blue clips. Yeah, that has something. <laughs> Esperanza's nervous. She's like, hey, you got this handle. So I was like, yeah, it's good. Don't worry about it. Big shootout happens. No one gets hit. And then the most badass way to escape ever, I mean, literally ever, there's, there's listen, there's no cooler way to escape. There's, there's only two ways in which you, you can escape something. Num- the, the second coolest way to escape is skydiving. No. Is skydiving no. With, with presidential masks on. Okay, yeah, okay? that's fair. And the number one coolest way to escape is via snowmobile. What about jet ski? No, Jeski's the lame cousin compared <sighs> jet to <pack>. Snowmobile. <laughs> jet pack. Uh, have you ever way, seen uh, Vin so... Diesel jet ski away? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he flies. <laughs> this leads to a scene where now that we know that our army reservists are bad guys, they're terrorists too, that our newest reservist, poor Billy, is riding a, as they're driving back to the airport he's so like gung-ho attitude about you know it's his first time with the guys and then they slit his throat and my entire thought w- watching that scene was like what if he was down too like what if you could have just offered him money like you didn't even offer him an option you just slit his throat like poor guy first day on the job McLean can't figure out why he can't hit anyone either. He's sh- laying into everyone on the snowmobiles. The most badass way to escape ever. He's chasing them down on the snowmobile. He can't hit anything, but they're able to hit him. He can't figure it out until at the very, very end after his snowmobile gets blown up. That is full of blanks. That the blue clips are blanks, but the red clips have the real bullets. And that the major from the military and Stewart's crew are all in cahoots. Mm-hmm. And that's why there was such a cool getaway on snowmobiles is because they were all working together for this badass plan to ride their jet skis across the frozen <laughs> lake. I had no idea you were yes. still like a 13 year old boy. <laughs> Which, oh my God. Can you right. imagine snowmobiling away after you blow it up and shoot out. And... Now, mind you, all of this has happened. This is just the first half of their elaborate plan. Their plan hinges on them getting a second plane to then fly them away to safety. A big so, S plane. That's a big plane. <laughs> that's- yes. While they are working on getting to that this next plane, John McClane goes back to the airport, fills them in on how they were all fooled by the Army reservists, and they proceed to gather all of the rent cops in the airport but before as they are all like victory charging the uh the hangar in which all of the bad guys are going to get away chaos ensues in the airport and all of the rent cops are stuck directing traffic including sipowitz's <laughs> brother charlie who happens to be waiting in the cop car like in the back of the cop car for no apparent reason like they hop in he's like this is my brother charlie hey how's it going <laughs> After gathering all the rent cops, they are ultimately, John McClane is left by himself at the end, trying to take down the entire plane himself. The big question for me on the 747 is that you're leaving Washington, D.C., one of the places with the most heavily guarded airspace in the entire world. Yeah. You're telling me that you're going to escape when you're 747, that they're not just going to shoot down. Why? Is, there's no one on the plane that, that they want to live. It's not like. There's a bunch of hostages on the plane. No. It's all just terrorists. Just so they up. just shoot the shit down as soon yeah. as they got over the Atlantic exactly. Ocean. <laughs> like, <laughs> Haven't they ever seen Con Air? That's what they're trying to do with Con Air the whole entire movie. Just shoot it down. No, wait. There's Nicholas Cage yes. on there. <laughs> this one guy may be all innocent. Right. We can't shoot it down. <laughs> For whatever reason, that's, that doesn't happen. In amongst the chaos, they're able to try and escape, but McLean's not having it. And so he takes, he as they are driving down the 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 runway to take off, McLean grabs the reporter who's been everywhere uh, and who has somehow acquired a helicopter at this point because she's always had a helicopter. Because she's a movie. news. It's a news thing. It was just parked out back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's but a news copter. She was yeah. traffic on the nines. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, like, but, all right, so we'll accept that. She's also the traffic copter lady. (laughs) And they all get in the traffic copter, and she is able to fly them over the taking off plane, and John McClane jumps out onto the wing of the plane. And so, then he starts throwing stuff into the engine of the plane, which obviously attracts the attention of the pilots. 
They're like, hey, get out there. You know, we need those <laughs> engines to fly. <laughs> so the first guy goes out there and fights John McClane. And epically, John McClane ends the fight by throwing him into the engine of the plane, killing him. Yeah. So he, he stuffs a bunch of stuff into the flaps on the plane so that and then you, they he, can't, he can't take yeah, off take because off. he can't get the flaps right. But as you know, when a bird flies into a plane, <laughs> it crashes the plane. Yeah, like Max is that bad, yeah. Put a 280-pound dude through an airplane engine? Don't worry. Fine. It just keeps going. It just smoothies Well, him. I mean, you're not, <laughs> you're not taking into account those were geese, okay? They're not regular birds. <laughs> Those were geese. What surprised me more than that, though, is that after he throws the guy through the engine, the guy standing at the door still has the balls to get out on the wing and fight him. Yeah, like, no. At that point, I'm staying at the door and just shooting at him from the door. Like, hell no. The, the last guy that went out there went through the damn engine. <laughs> Stuart is watching the entire thing. Yeah, why the would door. you go out there? Why, why would you go out there? Just shoot, shoot him. Yeah, exactly. Just shoot him th from yeah. the door. You have a gun, right? <laughs> Fight ensues. McLean loses it, mm -hmm. but when he falls, he's able to pull the plug on the jet fuel. That way, it starts emptying out onto the runway. They think the stewards team and Esperanza think they're fine. Think that they're fine. They're gonna take off. Yippee ki yay, motherfucker! Here comes the <laughs> fire trail up to your plane and blows it up. And it happens to be just enough light for all the circling airplanes to be able to land. Now. It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> a miracle. <laughs> and, and dude, and it's totally like that too because it's like the pilot's like, "Hey, now we can land. Get on the horn. Tell all the pilots, follow us in. The day's <laughs> yeah. been saved." But how and are they then, all like, going to land? Everybody lands. Spot. They're all like, uh, yeah, like everyone lands. So apparently, pilots don't actually need air traffic controllers. They all just magically land, and everyone's sliding down the big inflatable slides. <laughs> <laughs> at the end so everyone's there the mayor's there the president's there Sipowicz does the whole xmas rips up the parking ticket which i don't think really matters at this point because i'm pretty sure his car is already at the impound lot but uh yeah the impound lot guy doesn't care also it was only gonna be a 40 dollar yeah. ticket where is that at <laughs> <laughs> well but i mean long story short christmas is safe he gets his wife they get to go have christmas with the in-laws Happy, happy Christmas, everybody. I'm pretty sure Marvin is coming with them, too. He <laughs> no, he's up. a mole man. He gotta stay in the mo he's got to stay down there in the basement. Well, he specifically says, I'm not cleaning this mess up. <laughs> <laughs> he can take five <laughs> away in the golf cart. He's going to go on their romantic <laughs> vacation. They're going to go where they're going to go get a hotel and get room service and leave their kids with their grandparents. So we're, we're, we're wrapping up Die Hard 2. Let's just take a quick moment to acknowledge that there's some more movies that happen after sorry there's only one movie that happens after melissa and i want to make a clear point that john McClain saved holly twice yet holly can't make it to the third movie they have to get divorced yeah exactly what kind of wife is she he saved her twice <laughs> he did all that because she so. was on the plane like she could have took an uber <laughs> 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 also she took a job in another state Away from him because she didn't want to be. I understand it was a good opportunity. I get all that stuff, but he moved to a different state to go do what she wanted to do, and he still they still ended up divorced. What the fuck, Holly? Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> what does John McClane got to do to keep you happy? <laughs> he literally took down two terrorist organizations and saved you from a Won't plane that. crash. Mm -hmm. So obviously, the Die Hard movie franchise is based around John McClane, Detective John McClane, and his his. Uh, his adventures, I guess you can say. So, obviously, the Die Hard 1 and 2 are focused around McClane and his wife, him rescuing his wife. Die Hard with a Vengeance, which is the third movie, he teams up with Samuel L. Jackson, and I think that's kind of the end of the series, like you guys are hinting at, as far as you're concerned. As far as, like, the big box office hits as they were, that was kind of sort of the end of them. But it also saw the return of... So, like, the bad guy is Jeremy Irons in Die Hard with a Vengeance. And he's supposedly Gruber, the main villain from number one's, like, brother. So they did a tie-in there. And then from there... We have Live Free or Die Hard, which was a newer one. It was about he teams up with this hacker. He ends up having to save his daughter. Um, and actually, I kind of like that one. It was definitely a step down with A Good Day to Die Hard. Good news. There are rumors of a movie 
called McLean coming out soon. Oh. I don't know. It might have something to do with John McLean and Die Hard. I don't know. Look forward to what would ho- what's hopefully going to be coming out in McLean. So, <laughs> I would love to see the Die Hard series continue, especially now that Bruce Willis is uh, getting older and uh, more willing to do cornier scripts. He's willing movies. to get shot in the first five minutes of your thing for... <laughs> few hundred thousand dollars we've been tricked by that <laughs> one before <laughs> all right so let's go talk about this week's music in die hard and you think die hard not really known for music but also christmas movie so i cannot wait to know what the music is from this movie let's go take a look all right john as i mentioned die hard isn't exactly known for its music in the movie however christmas movie which means there's lots of opportunity here. What do you got for us this week? Let's start out with Old Cape Cod, which was written by Claire Rothrock, Milt Yakas, and Alan Jeffrey, and performed by Patty Page. Rothrock, Yakas, and Jeffrey were all popular songwriters in their day. And actually, Yakas also wrote Go On With The Wedding, for Patty Page. Patty Page was born Clara Ann Fowler, but was better known as Patty Page, the pop singer and actress. She was actually a really, really famous pop singer and actress. She lived from 1927 to, to 2013. She's the best selling female artist of the 50s and has sold over 100 million records in her six decade career. Damn. Yeah. So she first signed with Mercury Records in 47. She immediately became their first successful female artist. One of her signature songs, Tennessee Waltz, became one of the biggest selling singles of all time and is recognized as the official state song of the of Tennessee. <laughs> so literally wrote the the state song. One of her many hits also was how much is that doggy in the window? So if you want to know how iconic some of her stuff is. Wow. <laughs> if you have kids, you've probably heard of that song. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, she also had the Patty Page show from 55 to 56, which was f- 78 15-minute episodes edited together for a half-hour show. Okay. Uh, edited into 31 half-hour episodes. I don't Weird. know why... The length was, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, she also appeared in a few movies in the early 60s. Dondi, Elmer Gontry, and Boys Night Out. But yeah, she was just, she, was, she had this massive career. But let's get to our next song. We have Carol of the Bells, which is music by Mykola Dmitrovich Leontovich. <laughs> and lyrics nice. by Peter Wellhowski. All right, so Carol of the Bells. It was composed in 1941 by the Ukrainian composer Mikolai Dmitro, uh, Dmitrovich Leontovich. <laughs> and he was actually a hugely famous composer from that time and era. We, as Americans, know Carol of the Bells pretty much as Jingle Bells. I think uh. it's the easiest way... Jingle Bells. So, but it's it's our popular Christmas carol. The lyrics were written by Peter Wolhowski, who is of Ukrainian descent and known for his arrangement of Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mikolai, though, he was born and raised in Podlavia province of the Russian Empire, which would become the Ukraine. He was educated as a priest, but also worked heavily in music. And after the 1917 revolution, he moved to Kyiv, where he worked in the at the Kyiv Conservatory and the Mikola Lesen- Lesenko Institute of Music and Drama. He was uh, famous for hit for this song, but he was also known as a he's also known as a martyr by the Eastern Orthodox Ukrainian Church, mm. in which he did a ton of work in liturgy. I think he had some involvement in the revolution because he was assassinated in 1921 by a Soviet agent Damn. for Russia. Yeah, hardcore. So Jingle Bells, the writer of Jingle <laughs> Bells, was a I'm sorry, the composer of Jingle Bells was assassinated by a Russian agent. (laughs) Our next song is Finlandia, composed by Jean Sibelius. 
love it. Composed love by it. Gene Sadler. Yes, uh, it, it's it's a tone poem. Whatever a tone poem is, Gene is a Finnish composer because uh, we're so good. We're on such good terms. I know her by her fir- I know him by his first name, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Finnish composer, uh, and he wrote the tone poem in 1899. Uh, the so he was born Johann Julius Christian Sibe- Sibelius, uh, and lived from 1865 to 1957. <laughs> Other than being a composer, he's also a violinist and a pianist, and widely recognized as that country's greatest composer. And actually, at the time of his music, he he helped provide Finland a national identity, because this was during their struggle for independence from Russia. So apparently everything's about revolting from Russia and Christmas, (laughs) because those things go together. (laughs) So he'd record a... Eight symphonies, symphonies and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm not going to bore you with the specific works. Just know that like he's big enough that he was on the Finnish 100 mark bill until 2002 when they adopted the euro. Damn, so like he was on their currency. Damn. Yeah, he was on their currency. Our next song is "Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow," written by Sammy Kahn and Julia Stein, performed by Vaughn Monroe. So it was written in Hollywood in 1945 during a heat wave. Damn it, guys! If 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 "Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow" is a Christmas song, and it was written in July in Hollywood. <laughs> then why can't Die Hard 2 be a Christmas movie, even though it debuted in July? I don't care. <laughs> Which, by the way, Let It Snow, Let It Snow never once actually mentioned any holidays. It just talks about snow. And so it just gets played around holidays. They never once mentioned Christmas in that song. Oh, yeah. Or Hanukkah an, it, or anything else. It, it really speaks to us out here in Phoenix. <clears throat> we just associate snow with <laughs> holidays. Uh-huh. <laughs> Vaughn Monroe is an American baritone singer, trumpeter, big band leader, actor, and businessman. The guy, the guy was huge. He has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He is so famous that they could not contain it in one star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. They had to give him two stars. <laughs> uh, seriously, like they gave him one star for his movies and another star for like all the stuff he did in radio host of radio shows all through the 30s and 40s and stuff and as well as he was in movies and he had his own cvs variety show in the 50s he had a bunch of hits he was a band leader he was a stockholder at rca he was massive the writers sammy khan was a lyricist songwriter and musician best known for his romantic lyrics that were used in songs for film and broadway and some of his stuff that he wrote was for Artists like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. So he was actually a pretty big deal as far as a songwriter. And Stein is a British-American songwriter and composer who is also known for a series of Broadway musicals. Gypsy, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and Funny Girl, all that, all which in which became films. That brings us to our next song, Real Love, written by Andre Sim- Simone. <laughs> C Y M O N E. Sounds good to me. Why? <laughs> Written by Andre Simone and Jody Watley. <laughs> and performed by Jody Watley. So Jody Watley's the big name here. She's a, uh, she is an American singer, songwriter, and record producer. In 1987, she won a Grammy Award for Best New Artist. And actually, she's been in show business her entire life. First stage appearance was at eight years old. She got she climbed on stage with her f- with a family friend and godfather, Jackie Wilson. Mm. That's the soul singer, Jackie Wilson. At the age of 14, she would get a spot as a dancer on the popular television show, show Soul Train. <laughs> and actually, the show's creator, Don Cornelius, would would pick her and a few other members, a few other dancers from the show, and would form a R&B group called Shalimar. And so hmm. she was one of the members of Shalimar from 77 Damn. to 83. They released several albums. They had several hits, including a top 20 hit with Dead Giveaway. 
Then in 83, she would bounce around London and the UK for a while, make guest appearances on several records before starting her solo career, returning into the US, uh, returning to the US in 87 and releasing her self-titled solo album, which her first two albums would see quite a bit of commercial success and then it would wane a little bit from there. But she would release nine studio albums as, with one being released as recently as, 20, as 2006. So, and according to my records, she's still touring. And that brings us to our last song, which is Love Me Tender, written by Ken Darby as Vera Matson and Elvis Presley, obviously performed by Elvis Presley. So, let's first, let's get into the credits here. Elvis's camp insisted on getting a composer credit, even though he had no form in actually writing the song. Later in his career, Ken Darby would be asked why he used his wife's name, Vera Matson, as the writer of the song, and why he credited it to her. And he said, well, she also didn't write the song. <laughs> Basically, taking a shot to Elvis, kind of saying, like, well, Elvis <laughs> is on there. He's credited to Elvis. He didn't write the song. Well, neither did Vera. <laughs> so, so Ken Darby, guys, he's an American composer, vocal arranger, lyricist, conductor, and all around just badass goat. Just greatest of all time, baby. So his film scores have received three Academy Awards and one Grammy. And what I love about stories like Ken Darby is he's very much a behind the scenes, like you don't know that he's famous, but he's famous. He provided the vocals for the Munchkin Land Mayor in The Wizard of Oz, mm. 1939. <laughs> he also sang all of the music for the first album of music made for the movie, because at the time when the movie was made, they weren't always releasing soundtracks. And so a few years later, because of the popularity of the movie, they put together a soundtrack of music in which Ken Darby and the Ken Darby vocal, the Ken Darby singers did all the music for. So his group, the Ken Darby singers, they also sing backup vocals for the original 1942 recording of Bing Crosby's White Christmas. Everyone who has heard White Christmas, you have heard Ken Darby singing in the background. He also recorded several soundtracks for other MGM films and recorded soundtracks for the occasional Tom and Jerry cartoon. He was also the head composer and pro product supervisor for Walt Disney in 46, as well as Marilyn Monroe's vocal court coach for several movies, including Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. But yeah, just had freaking a hell of a career, man. I saw a picture of him too, man. He was kind of dreamy. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, and then this other guy, Elvis, Elvis Presley. Well, I mean, he had kind of a big career. They said he was the king of rock and roll. I think he knew Forrest Gump. <laughs> He's from Tupelo, Miss Mississippi. Um, and he did something like sold close to a billion records. Uh, kind of the best-selling all-time artist. So, um, yeah, who knows that little guy? Yeah. Maybe he'll get yeah. his credit. He knew Forrest Gump. That's pretty big. <laughs> it's a pretty big thing. So, uh, no, no, I'm not going to go into Elvis, number one, because we are we will ultimately see Elvis again, and so I can go deeper into him later. But he is so massive that, like, I don't need to go into Elvis. But have you heard about this Ken Darby guy? Like, that's... <laughs> That that was kind of my point with that 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 <laughs> song there. So and there's your music. I knew it was going to be solid because there's all these people from like the 1800s that lived in Russia that wrote the song Jingle Bells. This was going to be money and it delivers. Of course it delivers. Let's go give our final thoughts on Die Hard to Die Harder and the Christmas movie that it is. Okay, so I'm gonna start off here. Not because I have a major point. I just want to start. <laughs> I just like to be first. <laughs> the best part about Die Hard 2 Die Harder is that it's it's so ridiculous. It's so over the top. It's so amazingly 90s. I mean, even though it's 1990, like it is it is everything that was. And this is what most schools are. They take the movie that you like about the first movie and they take all the your favorite stuff and they ratchet it up to 12. And that's what Die Hard 2 does. It takes all your favorite stuff from the first one and makes it. All the way up to the, as high as you can make it. The only thing that Die Hard 2 is missing is Hans Gruber. Because Alan Rickman, mm. so just he's just so great. But to me, this is the better Die Hard movie. And if you package it together, Die Hard 1 and 2 and Lethal Weapon 1 and 2, you package those together. Those are the four greatest action movies that have ever existed. It doesn't get any better than those movies. They set the precedent for everything on what an action movie is, like when you do it 100% right, 
And you know what they all have in common? Take place at Christmas. <laughs> Deal with it, people. <laughs> On top of all of that, we can all agree, Holly's the worst. Melissa, <laughs> what are your final thoughts? Holly is the worst. She's the absolute worst. <laughs> I've never liked Holly. And also, they are Christmas movies and don't even come at us what they're not. <laughs> I don't care if Bruce Willis said they were not Christmas movies. They are Christmas movies. Don't try and ruin our Christmas tradition of watching this with our children. <laughs> I mean, you said it all. I like, I love Die Hard. I like Die Hard. I don't think, Ouch. I don't think, I don't think it's the best of the Die Hards. <laughs> It's a little bit too hard for me. I like the first one better, but <laughs> it's too. It dies too hard. It dies too hard for me. It, it goes dies too, too hard. hard. <laughs> I just like I just like Hans Gruber. I'm sorry, naked waving your wiener around does not equal Hans Gruber. There, that's my final words on that. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? First, I want to agree with Dom as I do think Die Hard 2 is the greatest of the Die Hards. You can not only do you get a guy killed by the conveyor belt, squished by the conveyor belt, sucked into an engine, and then murdered with ice with an icicle. And there's just more going on because he has more range. He has the whole airport to work with. I feel like like it's the the more action-y, the harder of the die hards. <laughs> And I do enjoy the newer movies. And I will still, I don't care how many diehards they make, I will watch every one of them just because I enjoy John McClane. And don't think that Bruce Willis doesn't know that John McClane, the character of John McClane is what broke his career. Because even when he's not doing Die Hard in the 90s, he was playing John McClane mm -hmm. <laughs> in other mm -hmm. movies. Like, that's how big that character was. You know, like we talked about with Rocky, like how iconic Rocky was and how iconic that character is. John McClane is on that level when it comes to action movies, and I, I don't care what you say, I will fight you over that. <laughs> but I told you at the beginning that I insist that this is the more Christmassy of all of them, that it is a Christmas movie. The first one, the argument with the first one is that even though it is a Christmas party on Christmas Eve, that somehow just because it's set around Christmas, they, they don't actually refer to Christmas at all and stuff. So like, all right. If that's not enough Christmas for you, then in the second one, not only is it set around Christmas, is it about him picking his wife up to have Christmas with her and her family, uh, her uh, his in-laws and his kids, but there is actual Christmas music on the soundtrack, and the end of the movie is him saving his wife so that they can go and then have Christmas with their kids. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Go to that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the other ways to get in contact with us. Twitter.com slash go with the heat. Instagram.com slash go with the heat. Facebook.com slash go with the heat. You know where we are. There is no excuse. We want to hear from you. I'm serious this time. I'm serious. You're going to email us. You're going to email us and tell us that Heart 2 is the hardest <laughs> Christmas movie that has ever existed. And when you go to yes. iTunes and you leave us a review, which we would really, really appreciate that because it helps people find the show, helps helps increase us in search rankings. It helps make sure that people are aware of the hardest Christmas movie ever. I want you to go to iTunes, leave us a review, give us five stars. No one cares about the star rankings, really. What they really care about is what you write in the reviews. That's what they really care about. We want to hear your fan fiction of the Home Alone versus McLean <laughs> fan fiction of Macaulay Culkin taking on John McLean and who would win that battle. The deeper the story, the better. Go to that website, goatheheat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe. You can find us on all the platforms, Spotify, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Overcast, Radio Public. I don't know. There's too many podcast places. What about just classic old RSS? You can go to our website and be able to get that link too. We'd love to hear from you these holidays and hear about your favorite Christmas movies as well. We'd also love to hear from you and just wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays and a Happy New Year. We will be back after the New Year ready for the greatest era of action movies to punch, chop, and kick your way into 2020. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoy the show and we'll see you all next time. Merry Christmas and bye.